it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, John San Giovanni. John is a mathematics supervisor in Howard County, Maryland, where he leads mathematics curriculum development, digital, digital learning, assessment, and professional development for 41 elementary schools and more than 1,500 teachers. John is an adjunct professor and coordinator of the elementary mathematics instructional leader graduate program at McDaniel College. He is a frequent speaker at national conferences and institutes, and he is also active in state and national professional organizations, and he, is curr he currently serves on the board of directors for the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. And now I will turn it over to John Giovanni. Hi, thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad that you uh, decided to spend some time with me today. Today, we're going to take a look at um, the opportunity of a wrong answer, um, using evidence to mine the gaps um, in student understanding. And even though wrong answer is highlighted in the title, um, sometimes right answers are opportunities to mine some gaps as well. Uh, on the screen is my email address and my Twitter handle, so feel free to send me a note anytime. I'm always happy to talk and, and answer questions, but be prepared be prepared for the question back at you. Um, during our hour together today, um, I really have one goal for us, and that is to identify a process for eliciting and using evidence of student understanding. Um, I'm gonna highlight um, my, my work with Mind the Gap for Mathematical Understanding um, throughout the, the session, but it's really about how do we elicit evidence and, and make use of that the evidence. Um, it aligns with our effective teaching practices from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, published 2014, Principles to Actions. Um, there are eight things we know that have an impact in our math classrooms. I know we've always chased things like rhyming and chanting of <laughs> basic facts or putting up anchor charts and all these other things, but we now know that these eight things are what are effective in mathematics. And today, we take a swipe at illicit and using evidence of student thinking. So I have a couple of propositions for you about evidence in general um, for us as teachers. We, we have a data culture, and that's not a bad thing, um, but it is a fact, and that may not always be the right kind of evidence that we're thinking about. Um, we haven't been trained to plan for or necessarily use evidence um, of student understanding as, as something else that I hold. And lastly, the proposition that we have been led to believe that mathematics is the pursuit of answers and so that it is, well, that is what we measure. Um, and so with these, with these ideas in mind, I, I wanna take us into another consideration, and that is how do we use evidence um, to collect and to um, go with the data? So speaking of data, um, a fourth grade student. So you have a fourth grade student who has a RIT score of 212 on MAP. Some of you probably know what that assessment is from NWEA. Uh, maybe in Maryland, you have a student who scores 695 on, on the park, or maybe in your state, it's a different labeling, and so the student scores profesh, uh, proficient on your state assessment. Um, or, or how about the student gets an 81% on a unit test? So we have some data, right? The question is, what do they know about fractions? And when Again, these uh, data points are, are not bad, that's not my message, right? But they can lead us to make some, uh, to infer, to make some inferences. And so when we infer about student thinking, um, you know, we draw conclusions as we should, um, but sometimes it's based on conjectures or speculations or, or even guesses. You think about some of the scores on unit tests or state assessments, um, and we may not be able to dig into what happened. Um, is there a misunderstanding? Is it possible that they got something correct for the wrong reasons? Um, and so it can be challenging to take actions on, on specific uh, content standards or, or ideas. Someone once shared with me this idea that our students are like icebergs and there's so much more um, below the waterline. Um, and, and I think it applies here too. When we think about understanding student understanding, um, we have what's above the waterline, um, such as state assessments, or maybe it's also, you know, MAP scores or PARC scores or SBAC scores or whatever state assessment you might have. Um, just that tells us a little bit about our students, but, but there's so much more, as you know. 
observations, general reflections, interviews, open-ended questions, portfolios, all of those things to me as a teacher told me so much more about my students and, and gave me an opportunity to take action on what they really understood. Um, to me, those things were evidence, right? Those things were the proof, the confirmation, the verification, the things I needed to make a strong, sound, intentional decision about a next step. And so to me, this idea of evidence versus inference, um, evidence are pictures and diagrams, calculations and justifications, maybe through discussion, maybe through writing. When I use evidence, I, um, I can make conclusions with confidence and I can have those focused next steps. But we've all inferred, and there's nothing wrong with inference per se, but it does lead to some of these things, right? So maybe you've said this or done this yourself. Well, he does it in class. Oh, it was just a careless mistake. You know, he was just having a bad day. Um, inference can, can then create things like misdiagnosis or maybe advancing a student before they have a sound understanding of the concept. Um, it may lead us to, to suspect that they have difficulty with retention of topics when really they never had a firm grasp of those topics. So today, spending time with you, I'd like to take a deeper dive into what is evidence and how can evidence um, enable us to make decisions about next steps? How can evidence help us identify the depth of student understanding? And how can evidence enable us to determine um, instructional focus for, for an acceleration situation for an intervention um, of students? So the three questions that I pose are, how do we elicit it? What constitutes evidence? And, and how do we use evidence? And keeping with the theme of mind the gaps, um, how do we mine for evidence is really, really the question. So what I'd like to share in our time together is um, a process for um, working with evidence and using evidence. Um, we're gonna use some student tasks, or excuse me, some student work um, from Mind the Gap. And um, we are also gonna use some tasks that are presented in the book. So how do we mine for evidence? The process that's been successful for me, um, you can see on the screen is um, thinking about knowing the math, selecting a task, considering what might count as evidence, interpreting it, and deciding on next steps, which then leads us back to knowing the math, selecting new tasks, and so on. This process uh, was guided for me by um, Smith and Stein's work with the five practices for orchestrating productive mathematics discussion. Um, so there's a similar uh, structure and it's featured again in Mind the Gap in terms of selecting tasks and anticipating what students might do. So let's just dig in. Knowing the math, it's not an insult, but to be clear, knowing the math means that we understand the concepts and the procedures fully. It means that we understand that there are varied procedures and strategies. Um, it means that we recognize where the math is coming from and where the math is going, um, and that we see connections among the ideas. That idea of knowing where math is coming from and where it's going is really critical because I wasn't trained to think about the standards coming after me or before me for that matter. Um, I was trained to think about what am I trying to teach that day and how was I going to get that across and not really thinking about how everything fits into a larger, a larger piece. Um, so with that in mind, we later today are going to look at three different tasks. A task that is subtraction within 20, a task that compares fractions, and an opportunity to represent integers. And so you may be a K2, 3, 5, or 6, 8 teacher or coach or supervisor. And so one of these tasks will fit with you. When we think about knowing the math, subtraction within 20, there's lots of things to consider, including what is subtraction? That is a takeaway, but it could also be a comparison. That there are different strategies, such as counting on or counting back, and that students can use different representations. Knowing the math when we compare fractions means we understand the ideas of benchmarks, distances from zero and one, the number of parts or the number of pieces. And when we think about integers, understanding what integers are in context, how we can represent them in those contexts or on number lines, and understanding how integers relate to one another. So when we think about knowing the math, these are a couple of the ideas relative to this um, task that we're going to select in a few moments. 
speaking of that, selecting the task is the second part of this process. And one of my favorite um, examples of why tasks matter is highlighted on the screen right now. Stein and Lane um, investigated the quality of, of tasks and how well they're implemented. And what I found to be most provocative is this notion that um, the quality of the task is critically important. And that in our classrooms, we want the C row or that green row to always be in place. But at the very least, we have to have a high quality task. Um, and so when we're selecting tasks, it's, in, it's imperative, especially for evidence, to have a really good task so that we can mine really good information. And then here's some proof of maybe tasks that um, don't give us the evidence we're looking for. So which fraction is the greatest? Well, we might have a student say six eighths, which is correct, but they might get the right answers for the wrong reasons. For example, that student might think that six eighths is greater than three tenths because it's missing fewer pieces. So then how would that student consider four fifths and nine tenths? Are they equivalent? Is the task on the screen something that will get us the evidence we're looking for? Which number is the greatest? 396 is the greatest number. But students might think that because nine, because 396 has a nine in it. So then that same student may believe that 499 is greater than 771. What might happen is a student who takes nine of these on a test and looks like they know what they're doing, but they may not. And one last example, which equation is true. And yes, 27 divided by nine equals three is true. But that student might believe that it is true because each number is getting smaller and division itself makes things smaller. That student may struggle tremendously with the notion of 100 divided by one. So poor task, lower quality prompts may not give us the evidence that we're looking for. Here's a classic example. What fraction does the point represent? Sure, it's three-fourths, but a student might get that because they are counting the tick marks, right? They're counting the totals. They might have um, a less than complete understanding. So this session is not just about wrong answers, but also right answers for the wrong reasons. So think about the task on the screen. Now take a look at these tasks. <laughs> Quite different. The task on the left is from um, Mind the Gap. And here we see students presented with some different fractions on a number line um, with no endpoint. And so they have to reason about where one half would be, for example, in the upper left-hand corner and how, how it changes, right? So each of those dots represent the fraction in the box, but the endpoint of one, um, well, may move and may not even be an endpoint um, relative to our understanding of how the dot represents the fraction. And on the right side, we see something else that's unique. And that is the idea that we actually don't have an endpoint of one, right? We have just noted where one is on these number lines. And students have to then think about the relationship between those fractions in the boxes and their placement, their relationship between zero and one. I share these examples with you because in the books, Mind the, Ta <laughs> Mind the Gap, I've offered four to five tasks for each um, big idea, and those are hard to tell, well, not that they're hard to tell, but they might be hard to see. Um, and so you can download all of these as Microsoft Word documents and then use them um, however you need. That being said, I think everybody would agree that there's a big difference between what you see on the screen and what you see on the screen now. The question is, which of these tasks give us better evidence of student understanding of fractions and the relationships between them? So selecting the task has one other piece <laughs> embedded in it, um, to do the task. And I know that sounds silly, but often was, we're busy and we're planning for math and, and other parts of our day and we select tasks, but we might not have an opportunity to do them. And it's critical that we do. Doing the task helps us think about a strategy um, that students might use to solve it. Um, it identifies maybe our own bias and how we would have or prefer a student solve a problem. Um, but doing it also helps us think about errors or the types of evidence we would want to look for um, and thinking about what mistakes or misconceptions that might occur as well. So selecting the task and the quality of it is critical, but taking a few moments to do the task is equally critical. That being said, this is really small on your screen, but if you get real close, you can see it. I've provided three different tasks from Mind the Gap for you to consider. If you're a K2 teacher, choose the one on the left, 3-5 teacher or coach, choose the one in the middle. And if you're a middle school teacher, uh, coach or administrator, what have you, take a look at the task on the right. 
And I'm going to give you just a moment or so to not write on your screen, of course, but think about how would you complete each of those um, problems. So again, take a look at your task and take just a few moments to consider what you would do. So on the task on the left, you obviously subtracted and maybe made jumps. Maybe big jumps, small jumps, who knows? In the middle, you compared, and then you thought about how you compared those fractions without using common denominators. And on the right side, you thought about negative 30 and how it relates to other numbers. So we've selected one of those tasks. We've now done the task, which takes us to our next step in the sequence. What's counting as evidence? In other words, when we think about what counts as evidence, we want to anticipate what students might do um, and think about what understanding will be shown or possibly a misconception or misunderstanding that might be shown. And I think this is where um, Peg Smith shared a lot or, or, or influenced me in that idea that anticipation is so critical when planning or thinking about evidence and, and not something that many of us were trained to do. So what counts as evidence? The questions we might ask, Will they have to compute? Do we want them to? Will they be able to justify their answers with a model or drawing? What might their drawings look like? What strategies might they use? How will they convey their understanding? Do they even have to write sentences? Would pictures and diagrams suffice? So those are the tasks that you just did a few moments ago. What counts as evidence? I'll give you about 30 seconds to think to yourself, what would you look for with your students who are working on this task? Diagrams, sentences, drawings? About 30 seconds and we'll come right back together. All right, so, so what counts as evidence? That's the question. Subtract, show you work on the number line. What did you think that would count as evidence? So things that I consider, hops on the number line. Students may show evidence of counting forward. Students may show evidence of counting backwards. We might see students hop by more than one or count by more than one, use groups. Will students just find the difference? What I mean by that is, they already know 16 minus nine, they write seven and they don't use the number line. Right or wrong, it's a piece of evidence. Did you select this task? How would students compare those two fractions without using common denominators? Hmm, they may most likely use representations of some sort, models, of fractions, right? They might mention benchmarks. They might mention um, the size of the pieces. They might mention the same number of pieces. That would be especially true for the second prompt. Some students may use a procedure. And I know the procedures get banged up a lot and I just wanna be clear that procedures are fine as long as we understand why and how they work. So students may use procedures. Ah yes, in the six eight example with integers. What endpoints might we have with a midpoint of negative 30 on two different number lines. Well, we may see some progression from negative to positive in one way or another. Might see a consistent interval from negative 30 to the left and to the right, um, meaning that they might use the same interval to the left and to the right of negative 30. We might see a positive and a negative endpoint. We might see an endpoint of zero in something because kids may have overexposure to number lines that have endpoints of zero somewhere. It's possible that we could see two negative endpoints as well. So we know the math, we've selected the task, we've done the task and consider what might count as evidence. Then students do the task, right? And as they're working, we are interpreting the evidence. What evidence do we have? 
What did they do? Is it evidence of understanding, misconception or misunderstanding? But something I wanna stress with everybody is, in this moment, it's not necessarily why it's happening. We're, we're not trying to fix it right in the moment always. Um, sometimes as teachers, or at least myself, I was always rushing in to fix the problem. And sometimes we have to let it evolve so we can see fully why it's taking place. Sometimes we may position it earlier in the conversation so that other examples will help students make sense of their misconception and, and, and change their thinking or, or grow their thinking, I should say. So we're going to take a look at those um, tasks that you just did um, and consider for evidence. We're going to take a look at some student work with those. Um, in the book, Mind the Gap, uh, for each of those grade levels, what I did was selected a task, gave it to students at random um, in classrooms um, in our district and others, and then I pulled it back and, and looked through um, and tried to find common things that kids did. They weren't always wrong. That's really important. Evidence isn't about being right or wrong. Evidence to me is about understanding. So here we go. First up, we have um, our first graders who are subtracting on the number line. I'll let you take a look for a moment before I identify some evidence. So first up on the left side, I noticed that we have differences um, for each equation that are off by one. And I notice that we have evidence of students who have hopped by one, a student who's hopped by one, and that student starts um, with 16 in the first example and ends with eight, so um, there's some match to their, to their equation. Interestingly, um, my second student um, on the right side here, I see um, equations again. All of those differences are, again, off by one, um, and I see jumps of one again. This time I noticed that the jumps begin, looks like one number less um, than, than um, the starting um, subtrahend. Another set of student work, same problem. The evidence that you might notice this time is that again, we have equations. Um, the differences are accurate. I also notice jumps of one, similar to the other students. I also notice that there are dots above those jumps. I don't know if you can see them, but there are dots clearly appearing above each of the jumps. And on the right side, um, we see a student who has, again, the correct differences. And um, a student who jumps um, by more than one in three of his equations or her equations. Another thing I notice is that bottom equation, just like on um, the left side, there's a jump of two. Um, so interestingly, I noticed that the person did not jump back nine or count up nine, but instead only moved two. We'll talk about this evidence in a few minutes, but I want to get into the three, five, and six, eight examples. If you're not a three, five teacher, or excuse me, if you are a three, five teacher, or six, eight teacher, when you look at first grade work, it's pretty fascinating the mathematics that they can do before they get to us. Now for a fourth grade student comparing fractions, um, evidence, I have a representation on the right side. It also looks like, um, well, it says that two eighths is greater than six, or excuse me, five, six. You might not have thought that originally. And um, the writing shows a couple of things as well. In fact, I note that in the writing, I compared eight and six, and eight is greater than six. So a piece of evidence for us to consider here in a few moments. Take a look at another student. Representations again. Um, interestingly, they are not the same whole at this moment. There's also a mention of over a half on that last line. So that may insinuate a benchmark conversation for the student. Evidence from a third student. Noting that five, six is only one more. <laughs> but with two eights, you need a lot more. <laughs> His words, not mine. Um, but again, two pieces of evidence that may shed light into how they're considering the relationship or the, the comparison of these fractions, excuse me. And last but not least, we have one more student example. Take a moment to look at the evidence that we have. 
And as you know, I'm not discussing why they did it yet. Here I have evidence of a student who says eight is greater than six. And so for all the other uh, information in there, that piece of evidence stands out um, to me. So for you six, eight folks, we're gonna take a quick look at your task as well, what evidence that came back to us. So on the left side, um, we have a student who found different endpoints, just like that person on the right side. Some evidence that I see. Zero is an endpoint. Identifying that the second number line is counted by three and using um, some multiplication in addition to show how we count by three, or excuse me, um, yeah, counting by three there. On the right side, see a student who um, has negative on the left side and positive on the right side in both, um, both number lines. Interesting statement, I halved um, the 30 to 15 and added 15 and took away 15 from both sides, that, that constant interval. Um, if you notice some the student work on the right side. Two more examples before we dig into so what, what do we do? Here we see a student on the left side, take a look at that evidence, some tick marks there. Interestingly, on the first number line, I see zero and negative 60, and on the bottom number line, I see zero and negative 40. It seems as though maybe the interval has changed for that individual. On the right side, a piece of evidence, student uh, interval of one, and then right below that, an interval of two. So what have we done? Well, we have selected the task, we've done the task, We've anticipated what they might do. Now we've solicited evidence from them, which leads us to the next and last step in this process. What do we do next? What would you do next? And I'm going to um, take it to a more general statement right now. Do we reteach it? Do we revisit? Or do we advance their thinking? More importantly, how do we know and why? As a teacher for me, if I had 27 students in my classroom, I couldn't make 27 groups of students to, to plan for the next day. I think what we need to think about instead is, what are some broad things I have to do? In other words, do I have an advanced situation, a reinforce, or a reteach? And I wanna talk about those just for a brief moment. Advanced means that students show full understanding. They have a solution, um, their reasoning and justification they're in place and they're clear, logical, and accurate. Reinforced to me is a student who has the right ideas um, about the concept and um, may need more exposure and practice. Um, I may not be as confident in their understanding, and so I may see some foundational understanding. They actually might have an incorrect solution, but that doesn't mean they don't have an idea of what's happening with the mathematics. Um, these students as well will have some reasoning and justification. We're gonna talk about some of those examples in a moment and how um, they relate to a student who we might need to reinforce. And again, that reinforces um, additional practice, some guided instruction per se, but um, it's not a complete, complete reteaching um, start over, so to speak, which is that red arrow on the screen. Um, evidence of limited to no understanding um, evidence of an incorrect solution um, or a coincidental correct. And so I showed that to you early, some students who may get a correct answer for the wrong reasons. Um, and so it's coincidental. Those could be reteach situations. And sometimes a student gets an 80% on the test, um, might have a good number of those and um, we can miss it. A student has flawed logic, so they may actually get a right answer. Um, but they might have, again, flawed logic, which goes with that coincidental correct. Um, or they have um, an inability to justify. So when I think about my students, I think about grouping um, them, um, using the evidence to group them into these, these three categories. Um, because reteach is reteach is reteach. And what I mean by that is um, I probably have to work on the concept completely over again. And so 
um, if two of us have significant um, flawed logic, we both need to be teaching, right? Um, that being said, let's take a look at some of those students that you just, uh, you just look at their work and we looked at their evidence. Um, so the student on the left side noted that all of those differences are off by one. The same is true um, for the student on the right side. Those are all off by one. The student on the left side starts with 16 and makes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight jumps um, and ends on eight. So all of his jumps are off by one. A student on the right side um, has the right number of jumps, but starts one left of 16, one left of 13, and so on. So both of these students to me um, are reteach students, right? The student on the left is most likely counting 16 once before he or she starts to jump. And so that's why they have one less jump. Um, but it doesn't really matter. The fact is they don't understand subtraction at this point. Not yet, they will, they just don't know it yet. And so um, this student is per perfectly placed with the student beside him where we're, we both need to explore um, and reestablish what subtraction is. On the right side, we see a student who shifts one over and then starts jumping back and so therefore they're one off each time. So these students are reteachers for me. Um, the next set of students here, um, on the left side, uh, we have a student who has the correct differences and jumps of one. And um, so I see clear understanding from the student, but even with clear understanding, there's some things that I need, would want to work on. Those dots concern me, not because <laughs> they're bad, but it seems as though the individual had to jump back and then count the number of jumps to find their difference. Um, and so one-to-one -one counting, though there's nothing wrong with it, it's not necessarily an efficient strategy. And so, um, I have a student that may advance um, that can make that argument because they show understanding of subtraction, but I also have a student that I might want to reinforce, like how can I be more efficient with my jumps? Um, and then the student on, a, on the right side, maybe that maybe the student who works with the student on the left, the student shows understanding of subtraction and is starting to show more sophisticated um, strategies, maybe advanced to different um, situations and so forth. One thing to note, fascinatingly, on the bottom of both of these students, they found the difference between two points. The difference between 11 and 9 is 2. So they both see subtraction as not just takeaway or counting back, but also the difference between two points. So let's take a look at this guy, um, 335 teachers. Um, lots of evidence here, nice representation. Um, until we talk about I compared eight and six. Um, so this is a student that probably is a reteach, but just like every student, I have something to work with. So even students that um, get everything wrong, still there's something to build off from and work from. This student can represent a fraction. Um, they recognize that the holes need to be the same size. And so um, though the comparison is not there yet, right? Um, we, we can build off of this. And so we have to establish the meaning of the part the whole relationship. Hmm, our second student. Um, like some interesting thinking here. So this is a student that we might just need to um, reinforce their understanding. One of the things that I'm concerned about is that we're comparing two different uh, sized holes. Um, you know, so that could be a problem. However, the bottom statement talks about um, over a half um, and not a half is part of the first part of the statement there. So it might be a student who is just considering benchmarks and they use the representations. Um, so this is a student that I might want to ask a follow-up question. I could make an argument for a student who's ready for advancing or may need some reinforcing of having and comparing the same size holes. As we look at our third student, five, six, and two eights, no representation, but that's okay. As teachers, sometimes we're suckers for representations and we see them and we love them but they may not tell us all that we need to know, especially when you think about the student right here. So um, our third student, no representations, um, talks about comparing the denominators first, um, and then talking about eight is greater than six, two is not greater than five, but that doesn't matter. Um, so two eights is greater than five, six. This is a student that, um, is showing some need for, for reteaching because this, like the first student, is thinking about um, just the largest whole number and comparing in that way. 
last week we have a student thinking about the distance from um, from one or one hole. Um, a good strategy works well. Um, this student is a student that um, likely want to be advancing. Um, I might need to do some some revisiting just for one thing. Um, and he talks about the number of pieces missing. And so this is a student where I want to ask. So is four fifths and nine tenths equivalent? Um, only because the student didn't talk about um, how that 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 distance matters, um, or how the missing pieces, the size of those missing pieces pieces matter. So it's likely a student who could be advanced, but there might be some things I need to just to, to, to revisit before moving on. And for the last group, our six, eight folks, we take a look at the student on the left side there. Um, so some nice ideas when you think about the intervals, right? And thinking about the fact that um, negative 30 is halfway between zero and negative 60. Um, and that negative 30 is um, 15 away from both negative 15 and negative 45. The errors are consistent, which I find to be interesting. Um, so I, I could make a case for a student who um, may be someone we could reinforce, but probably needs some reteaching as you and I know um, number lines don't function in that direction, um, in that way. The student on the right side, um, has some similar nice ideas about intervals, um, but they're off by a bit. And so, as you know, um, 15 more than negative 30 would be negative 15. And 15 less uh, would be negative 45. But there's some issues there with thinking about how he have didn't put 15 um, on either side. So, as you know, a positive 15 is 45 more than negative 30. So, again, I see the student as someone that may need to be retaught. A student who can recite rules about integers, but doesn't necessarily understand how they're related. So look at one more set of students and then we'll start to wrap up our time together. On the left side, the tick marks are fantastic. I see a student skip counting, or excuse me, counting by intervals of 10, um, which is strong, but um, interestingly enough, when we move to the second number line, um, he kind of jacks up those, those intervals, right? So we see an interval of negative 30 and negative 10. Um, and in relation to the number line right above it, um, I see some, some incomplete understanding, so to speak. So in this task, if there was just one number line on top, we would think, hey, he's got it. Um, but when you put that number, the second number line right below it, hey, maybe he doesn't, right? And so there's still... Um, Still time to get in there and, and still time to, to develop some things. On the right side, you can see the arrows advance or reinforce. Let me talk about that real quickly. Um, a student who sees that negative 30 um, relates to lots of different numbers um, by ones and by an interval of two. Um, like the first student, he is somebody who I need to investigate why um, the number lines are reversed, so to speak, why negative 31 isn't on the left side as opposed to the right side. Um, it might be something very subtle, which would lead me to an advance, um, or it might be, might be something that I need to spend more time with on the number line in general. Um, so it's nice that he can see different size intervals, et cetera, um, but I have some work to do probably around the direction of that number line. Um, so that being said, that's a process for using evidence and starting with knowing the math, selecting the task, doing it, considering what kids might do, interpreting it, deciding on next steps, and then using what we know about math to move forward. So all the student work we just looked at a moment ago is really tied to this notion of what do we know about how students understand integers, fractions, subtraction, and so forth, um, how they represent their ideas, what are the errors that they make, um, and why they happen, so that then we can um, use what we know about math to, to um, move them forward. So I started this conversation with you tonight about data and um, park scores or, or SBAC scores or um, you know, unit assessments in your district. And I, I wanna come back to that because I, I work in a district where data is very important and it should be. I'm not, not here to um, take any swipes of data necessarily or um, say anything derogatory about data, but Sometimes I feel as though we're data rich and information poor, and maybe you feel that same way. 
Um, to me, data discussions might be thought of as a summative action. Um, it's a nice way to check in with some common measures, um, some litmus tests, see where we are and um, the progress we're making towards benchmark goals. Um, sometimes though, the, the data discussions revolve around um, lower level items, things that students may, um, may get right for the wrong reasons or um, you know, may not give us everything we want or need. Um, and sometimes, <laughs> as you know, those data discussions uh, can place an overemphasis on numbers and percents. Um, and sometimes I, I need to think about reteaching, reinforcing, advancing. So that speaks to evidence review, which is something that um, my math coaches and, and our math office is trying to help our teachers think about as well. Um, data discussions play an important role, um, but thinking about evidence is also uh, critically important. So to me, evidence review might be thought of um, as formative, right? And, and it can happen in action. Sometimes waiting for the Friday quiz is too late. Sometimes waiting for the exit ticket is too late. Um, so evidence review is something that can happen during class, um, but it obviously can happen um, collaboratively with teammates. Evidence review can help us determine the length, um, the depth, and the quality of our students' understanding. Evidence re review um, can help us understand misconceptions or incomplete or unfinished learning. Evidence review can help us think about what we might need to do next. Um, it can help us think about specific next steps. And I don't know that data can always do that. Um, and again, not to say that data can't tell us that we need to revisit fraction concepts because we do we have some need in fractions compared to other ideas. But what they know specifically about a fraction, to me, comes more from evidence than it does a test score. That being said, today we kind of talked about mining gaps in student understanding, the opportunity of a wrong answer. And I wanted to briefly share with you a process for using evidence um, as, as part of our classroom instruction and daily instruction, but also as part of our weekly review of student performance or you know, semi-frequent um, data conversations, how we support those through, through evidence. Um, I do have some time left over and I saw some questions come in. So I'd like to take some, a moment or two to uh, answer any questions if possible and then um, wish you a good evening. Again, my email address is on the screen. My um, Twitter handle is there as well. And the student tasks that I shared with you tonight come from Mind the Gap, um, a K2, 3, 5, and 6A publication. Those publications feature rich tasks or good tasks for soliciting evidence from um, the big ideas in math, as well as student work and what students do when they encounter those tasks. Hi, John, I had one question that came in. Would you like it now? Yeah, sure. Can you uh, go into detail about how you would talk to students uh, about benchmarks, especially at the three different levels that you outlined in terms of um, revisiting and so forth? Can you talk about how you speak with students about that? Yeah, so when talking with students, I think the first thing we always do is honor their, their effort and what they were thinking. Um, we ask them to tell us more about um, um, their, their ideas and what they put on paper. It, I think helping kids understand that, um, it's funny, because when we talk about reteaching with kids, we talk about that, that we had some mistakes and, and so we haven't got there yet, and we're gonna spend more time with the topic because it's a really important topic, no matter what it might be. Um, I know that in my classroom, sometimes I told kids mistakes matter, but I didn't actually use those mistakes. Um, and and so when we talk about reteaching with our kids, it's not just, um, hey, you made a mistake, but it's also let's further develop the idea and compare back to what we were thinking previously. Um, for reinforcement, we talk about the need for, um, you know, you can you show that you, you understand something, but more practice is needed. Um, and we associate that with playing an instrument or um, you know, playing sports, you can do certain things, but practice with that's necessary. Um, and with advancement, you still need practice, right? Um, but you might be ready for um, a new challenge or the next um, evolution, so to speak, of the concept. So helping students understand that those three things are not judgment on who they are or what they can do, but instead, um, they're actions that will take to help them meet their goals in math.
Terrific. That that was the last of the questions. Uh, someone also wanted to know if you're presenting at NCTM this year. Oh, fantastic. Um, yes, I am at NCTM. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be Saturday morning. Um, I'm also part of the Ignite special event on Friday evening at 6 p.m. Um, so that'll be fun. And um, I'm fortunate enough to be speaking at NCSM um, as well on Tuesday. I wish I could tell everybody the titles, but obviously uh, I don't have those handy. I do know Tuesday midday at NCSM, NCTM Ignite on Friday night. And uh, that's always a lot of fun. And Saturday morning um, at NCTM. So thank you so much for asking. Terrific. And that was the last of the questions. Perfect. So again, I wish everybody a wonderful evening. Thanks for spending some time with me. Um, my email address and Twitter handle there. Always interested in the conversation. And Margaret, are you going to jump on? Yep, I'm here. Uh, thank you, John, for showing us not only how to take advantage of the wrong answer, but as you said, the right answer. As a reminder, John's uh, three Mind the Gap books for grades K2, 3, 5, and 6, 8 are available on corwin.com with an everyday educator discount of 20%. John is also available for professional development at your school or district. And as he said, he will be a spotlight speaker at NCSM and a speaker at NCTM in just a few weeks if you plan on going to either of those conferences in DC. And we will be sending a webinar, uh, a recording of this webinar, as well as a PDF of John's slides via email in a few days. And thank you once again, John, and thank you everyone for participating. Thanks folks, have a wonderful evening. And thank you Jeff and Margaret for facilitating and supporting this. Uh, it's helpful for everybody to have an opportunity to spend a few moments to learn about math.